Hi there, guys. So this is 14M, and this is an, an extension to the goodness of fit tests. So this is called, what's it called? It's called estimating parameters. And essentially, if you're saying your information potentially looks like it comes from your sample data seems to have come from a normal distribution, but you don't know what the underlying distribution was, and you're having to estimate the distribution, then you're reducing the number of degrees of freedom which you have. So what you need to do is take away one from each of for, for each of the parameters which you're now estimating. So um, if we have a little look at uh, let's look at example 15, for example. Uh, it says the length of fish caught in a lake are thought to be normally distributed. So we don't have the original normal distribution um, data, the parameters. Um, and this is, this is, in fact, quite a realistic situation. So this is a good adaptation, in fact. So then it says to test this, the belief, this belief uh, that 200 fish were caught and measured and the results are shown in the table below. Sorry, misreading that slightly. So it says length between 0 and 10, 45 fish and so on. You can see this kind of looks normally distributed. There's, there's, there's more in the center than there are at the edges. Potentially, it's kind of loaded to the front a little bit. In fact, this one. OK, using estimates for the mean and the standard deviation of the population taken uh, from the sample data test the hypotheses at the 5% level. OK. Um, so uh, just, just one point in terms of why you're taking off one extra from the degrees of freedom. So in this case, your degrees of freedom will be five. OK, so in other words, if you have the total number of fish and you have five of the totals in here, then you can work out the other one from the, um, from the data that you have. So you don't need to have 10 here. So that one is, is, if you like, not a free piece of information that is, that is dependent on the other bits of information that we already know. And likewise, here, the mean is dependent on this information that we know already, and so is the standard deviation. So that's why we need to take off one for each of those. And the consequence of that, of course, is to then have to bring in your chi-squared value. So, for example, if you're doing at a 5% level, if you're reducing your degrees of freedom to 3 from 5 originally, if you knew the parameters, then uh, you'd be getting a much lower value, a critical value, which would mean to say that you're putting stricter conditions on the test that, that your, your test statistic will need to be lower in order to pass this, this, criteria, this, this critical value rather than this, this larger critical value. Okay, right, so let's have a go at this question then. So degrees of three, freedom in this case are three because we're taking away one from n, we're taking away another two from the parameters being estimated. Okay. Now, there's a little problem, I think, from the answers in the book in this case, and even slightly to the answers in the, in the worked calculator solutions from the online version of the textbook here as well. I think there is a mis mistake in the version of the book which I have, and which is still up, up online, but obviously that may change shortly um, as they make corrections as they go along with the first cohort um, taking, uh, doing uh, the entire book. Okay, so what do we need to do? Well, we need to put this information into the table, into a table in our calculator to start off with. So let's add spreadsheet and let's put in, so zero to 10, we're going to put in as five. Uh, 10 to 15, we'll put in as 12.5. 15 to 20 is 17.5. So we're just putting in, you can see the middle of each of these class widths. Uh, each of these categories. So we've got 27.5 there, and finally we've got 35. Then we can put in our results. We've got there, let's go up to the top. So we've got 45, 55, 38, 27, 25, and 10. And this obviously is all happening on the TI Inspire. Um, this calculator, this is what I am doing. 
There we go, just put data in there. So now I'm going to menu, statistics, and I want stats calculations, so one. And this is one variable statistics. We only have one variable in this case, the number of fish. So one variable statistics, and there's one list. Okay, and there's a frequency to that list as well. So my list is in A, I haven't renamed it. My frequency is in B, so I'm gonna put in B followed by the square brackets. Uh, my category list, I don't need to worry about. Results columns, D, fair enough. And so we can see then we're getting a mean. So the unbiased estimator of the mean is 16.11, so that's just the normal mean. And then SN minus one, so you can see here that, here we go, let's just put that one there. So you're getting SX, and then it says that's the same as SN minus one. If I click back to that, you'll see that it tells you on this calculator that SX is the same as SN minus one. So that's our unbiased estimator for the standard deviation. And underneath there is the standard deviation as well of this sample. Um, so there's the two things there. So you're getting 8.46474. Okay, I'm gonna write that one down because I'm gonna use that. So that's 8.46474 is um, SN minus one, or what they're calling SX there. Okay, now you can see that they've got that here as well. They're saying um, that the hypothesis here, you should state your, always state your hypotheses at the start. The H0 says that the fish in the lake have a normal distribution, are distributed normally um, by a mean of 16.1 and a variance of 8.46 squared. And the H1 says, the alternative hypothesis says here that that's wrong, that that's not true. This doesn't follow a normal distribution. Okay, and then it says there's some, some expected values. Now, for the expected values in these cases, again, you're going to work out your normal distribution here. So let's go back to, let's go back to calculate, and I'm gonna go for probability, and that's where I think I've got one of the results wrong here, or at least on the book. So we're gonna go probability, distributions, I want to go normal CDF, and I want to go normal CDF with a lower bound of negative a huge amount. And upper bound is going to be here up to 10. And the mean is, uh, what have we got, 16.1. Now, 16.11 something. I forgot to write that one down. Uh, let's go back to the... Let's go back to the sheets. Hang on a second. So what are we got? 16.1125, something or other. Okay, right. So there we go. It's got that. So I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna go back to home. We go back to calculate and so back to menu five probability. Distributions five, normal CDF. Uh, upper bound is 10, mean is 16.1125, and the standard deviation is 8.46474. Okay, let's go and check what we're getting for that. So we're getting here 23.5%. Um, okay, so I'm now going to times that by the 200 fish that I have to get my expected value, yeah, and I'm getting 47.0 there and that's giving me 41.3 now what i suspect to be the case there is that they've perhaps gone from zero to ten now you shouldn't do from zero to ten because otherwise you're not going to get um you're not going to get the expected number to equal to 200 when you total the expected number and as we've seen that happen in previous exercises by the way as well so that's not just here going wrong Okay, so let's just check the version of this on here. So let's just make myself move myself a little bit there. So we can see that we're getting, oh, they do things slightly differently here. No, they don't. Same, same, same. They've come up with this table. 
and they've just put so they've put in the stat values that's kind of interesting they've used the they've used a, a drop down list here and uh, gone into select stat value x bar that's kind of interesting so they've made up the normal cdf directly from the spreadsheet whereas i wrote it down so that's actually a, a, a neat little trick there so they've gone down to the drop down menu for the standard deviation and x bar so that saved them from having to um yeah that saved them from having to to um to write those two things down okay and then the probability directly is entered directly into the table so they've got a probability in this case okay so they're putting the probabilities into the table instead of writing them down for myself i uh, and in the exam I, I would want to write them down anyway so i don't see that there's much much advantage of doing this on a spreadsheet really um, but you can see how they've done this as well they've gone to uh yeah they've gone to the next the next uh empty column essentially and put that one in okay and so then they've done that, I think, for each of the next ones. And then they've done times by 200, which is, again, it takes a long time to do, whether you write it down or whether you do it on, on here as well. The advantage of writing it down, of course, is you're showing the examiner what you're doing. OK, and so their answer here was, same as mine, I think. Yeah, 47.0225 or 47 I'm getting here. So, yeah, the same. So they're getting the same answers as, as I'm getting as well just by doing it on the scratch pad. Okay, right. So then we need to do a goodness of fit test. And now their advantage of having this in the table already is of course that they've got now their, their, um, their probabilities times by 200 already in the table and they can do the goodness of fit test straight away from the naming of their columns, which they named as E and the observe list as N in this case. So uh, I'm going to cheat a little and actually take their values here. I think I might be missing one. So what have we got here? We've got uh, the missing one. One down to six. Yeah, so we're missing one of those probability values. So I'm going to need to work that one out. So a little work for me to do here. So we've got, in this case, um, so normal CDF again. Just doing the final one here between 30 and 40. So probability, normal CDF, distributions, normal CDF, we're starting at 30. Now, we need to go up to in infinity, if you like, here. So I'm going to put in 9,999, just a really large value. And I'm going to put in, again, 161125 and for the standard deviation we've got 8.46474 press okay for this one and it's giving me an answer of 0 0.050437 and also times that by the 200 fish to get me my expect expected value there which is an expected value of 10.087437 and so on Okay, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so let's have a look at putting these values in. Let me just check against their value here. Yeah, so they've got the same probability up here as well from going from 30 up to positive infinity as well. Okay, so now I'm going to go to my table. You can see this is obviously a long question. It's long whether you do the spreadsheets version or write it down, but you will still need to write it down in terms of for your, for your exam. So, so to spreadsheets again and putting in this information now. So I've got uh, original table. Let's go back to my data there. So my original table's got 50, 45, 55, and so on. And so then for me, my expected values are going to be, let's move me. Expected values are going to be here. So we're talking about 47, 47.0225. I'm going to write these in fully, in fact, to try and see if we can get exactly the same result as them. So 
And for six, I've got that one separately, that was 10.087437. Now, uh, since none of those values for the expected values are below five, we don't have to collapse any columns here, which would make it that bit more complicated, of course. So now I've got my results in B and C. So I'm going to go statistics, stat tests, and goodness of fit test again, so number seven. So I'm, my, I've got my observed list in B. I've got my expected list in C. So I've got C, square brackets. Degrees of freedom in this case are three, I think. Choose three. Or our degrees of freedom here. So we had EF3. So we took away the one and take away one and take away the two um, estimates for the mean and the standard deviation. So, so degrees of freedom are three. And I'm going to put my results in a later column because I have other stuff going on as well. So let's put that in, I don't know, G. Okay, so I've got my p-value here. It's turning up to be 0 0.3341. So you can see that's slightly different to the p-value that they're getting here. So I think that's because of the mistake they've got here. And let's have a look here. What's their p-value? What are they getting? 0 0.03314, yes, getting the same thing. <laughs> so I said even the p-value is slightly different on the worksheet. I'm wrong. I've done it completely there, and it's good. So p-value is slightly different on the worksheet, potentially, of what I meant was compared to this p-value here. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's wrong. So there's just a mistake in the book version. There's not a mistake in the worked version on the calculator. Good. Okay, so the p-value is 0 0.03341. That's underneath 5%. Therefore, there's, there's sufficient evidence to reject uh, H0 and accept the alternative hypothesis that these fish do not follow the normal distribution. And in fact, when you're looking at this, you can see it's kind of loaded to the front. It's positively skewed. It's loaded to the front of the distribution here. So potentially it looks more like um, a Poisson distribution, in fact. Okay, well, there's that. There's example 16 to come. I'm just going to pause off and drink my tea. Okay, we're back again. The tea has not got cold this time. Mm. Fantastic. Okay, so the next part, so we'll look at the next one. There's another example here. I'm not going to labor this because it's essentially the same thing that we're doing again and again here. So um, there's one interesting thing about the next question, and that's how they work out the um, – this is, this is a binomial distribution, and it's how they work out the probability. We, we know N. We don't know P. We have to make an estimate from P from the table. So um, we're talking about an archer here. An archer fires five arrows at a target, aiming for the bullseye in the center. She feels that she has an equal chance of hitting the bullseye with each shot, um, that each shot is independent of the ones that have gone before, and so the binomial distribution is a good model to use. Right. So that could have been a question. It wasn't a question, but they could say, why? Um, why what assumptions would you need for the binomial distribution? So the assumptions that we need are the probability is the same each time and that each shot is independent of the previous one. Okay, and to test this belief, uh, she looks back over her records and notes the number of times she has hit the bullseye in the last 150 sets of five arrows fired. These results are recorded in the table below. Okay, so we've got the results there. So... Okay, so importantly, each time she does this, um, she fires five arrows. Okay, got it. So this should be following a binomial distribution then. And let's move me slightly. Right, so this should be following a binomial distribution. X is distributed following binomial. And there's um, each time, 
Okay, each time that we're doing this, um, so it's a bit like the the example which we did earlier. Um, yeah, the previous binomial question <laughs> which we did, uh, where there was there, there was uh, the flipping of the coin, and there were 150 trials. I think maybe can't remember the number of trials now, but you know, it was similar to that where we had three comma zero point five, and that was one of the trials. Okay, so in this case, one of the trials is saying that we're following a binomial distribution with five shots, and each of the shots has a certain probability. Now, we're going to have to estimate that probability. Now, remember that your mean and your variance from a binomial distribution are given by NP, and the variance is given by, so sigma squared, is given by NPQ, Q being 1 minus P. Okay, now we don't need to estimate uh, uh, sigma squared here, the variance or the standard deviation, because we don't need that in order to come up with our expected values. We only have the issue that we have one of our parameters missing. So we'll only need to take one extra of our degrees of freedom. In other words, degrees of freedom in this case is n take away one, and take away one for the extra parameter which we're going to need to estimate. So degrees of freedom is going to be four. Okay, now um, how do you work out P? Well, you can work out P from this. We can find a mean from this table. We can do that um, directly from this table. Um, we can put that table into our um, spreadsheets on the calculator on the GDC, and we can work out uh, the mean and then simply rearrange that to work out the probability. So the mean turns out to be 2.82. So I suppose if this was, um, I guess if there was a half chance, say for example it was she got 2.5 out of 5, there was an average, that would be a half chance. That would be 2.5 out of 5. Okay, that would be a half chance roughly. Now in this case, it's a little bit more than a half of her hitting the bullseye, chance of hitting her, the bullseye. So how do we get that? Well, you just do the... Um, 2.82 divided by 5. That's the probability. Okay, so now we have the estimated parameter. And now you can then say, let's work out the probability of getting 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Again, I would probably just do it on Scratchpad. It's just super simple on Scratchpad. I would write those values down in a new table or a table of values underneath here. So I'd write down the expected values. And then obviously times them by 150 to get my so probabilities times by 150 to get my expected values. Okay, right. So after that, then you're going to need to combine some columns. Do they say combine some columns? Why? Yeah, right. So you'll need to combine. Oh, so you're going to need to combine the first and the second column in this case because we don't we have a um, a number which is below five as an expected value. So in that case, we'll now, we can simply com combine our answers for our expected values for um, 2.36 and 15.3 combines to, to give 17.7. .7. So now we have five values. We have one estimated parameter and one off n for the degrees of freedom as well. So that gives us degrees of freedom now of three, not four, as I originally said, because we had to combine two of the, the columns. Okay, and then of course you can put it into your calculator as normal. Um, put in the, the observed values and the expected values and do a goodness of fit test, chi squared goodness of fit test, and you will get your answer. Uh, out of interest, the p-value here is below 5%, so, um, so we would reject the null hypothesis that the data follows the binomial distribution. In other words, we don't really know what distribution it's following. Okay, I think that's it. We're going to move on next time to, let's just check it out. That's 14M. So the next one is, let's see if it's at the bottom. No, it's not. It's choice, validity, and interpretation of tests. Oh, I think this is a wordy one. So a bit on data mining there. Uh, that's a quick question to go through. Example 17, 14N, and then... The uh, type one and type two errors, which is important to go through. 
and a little bit more. There's a lot of discussion on this. And then uh, finally, I think there's Bayes' theorem in the last exercise, so three exercises to go here. Okay, thanks for listening in.